Bong. Holy crap. A concise account of the great war between the Empire and the Eldmari Dominion by Legate Justinius Quintius. Author's note. Much of what is written in this book is pieced together from documents captured from the enemy during the war, interrogation of prisoners, and eyewitness accounts from surviving soldiers and Imperial officers. I myself commanded the 10th Legion in Hammerfall and Cyrodiil until I was wounded in 175 during the assault on the Imperial City. I have done my best to fill in the gaps with educated conjectures based on my experience as well as my hard-earned knowledge of the enemy. The Rise of the Thalmor Although it is not well known, Somerset Isle suffered from the Oblivion Crisis as much as Cyrodiil did. The elves made war upon the Oblivion invaders, occasionally even crossing over to close down Oblivion gates. As a nation, they had more success than Cyrodiil did. Although the limitless Daedric hordes made the outcome a foregone conclusion. The Thalmor had always been a powerful faction within Somerset Isle, but had also always been a minority voice. During the crisis, the Crystal Tower was forced to give the Thalmor greater power and authority. Their efforts almost certainly saved Somerset Isle from being overrun. They capitalized on their success to seize total control in 4E22. They renamed the nation Alinor, which harkens back to an earlier age before the ascendancy of man. Most people outside of the Aldmari Dominion still call it Somerset Isle, either out of peevishness or ignorance. In 4E29, the government of Valinwood was overthrown by Thalmor collaborators and a union with Alanorc proclaimed. It appears that Thalmor agents had formed close ties to certain Boss Mary factions even before the Oblivion Crisis. The Empire and its Bosmer allies, caught completely off guard, were quickly defeated by the much better prepared Altmer forces that invaded Valenwood on the heels of the coup. Thus was the Eldmari Dominion reborn. Shortly afterward, the Eldmari Dominion severed all contact with the Empire. For 70 years, they were silent. Most scholars believe there was some sort of internal strife in Alinor but very little is known of the factional struggles that went on inside the Dominion while the Thalmor consolidated its power in Somerset and Valenwood. In 4E98, the two moons, Masir and Secunda, vanished. Within most of the Empire, this was viewed with trepidation and fear. In Elsinvir, it was far worse. Culturally, the moons are much more influential to the Khajiit. After two years of the Void Nights, the moons returned. The Thalmor announced that they had restored the moons using previously unknown dawn magics, but it is unclear if they truly restored the moons or just took advantage of the foreknowledge that they would return. Regardless of the truth of the matter, the Khajiit credited the Thalmor as their saviors. Within 15 years, imperial influence in Elsphere had so diminished that the Empire was unable to respond effectively to the coup of 4E115, which dissolved the Elsphere Confederacy and recreated the ancient kingdoms of Aniquia and Pelatine as client states of the Aldmari Dominion. Once more, the Empire failed to stop the advance of Thalmor power. When Titus Mede II ascended the throne in 4E168, he inherited a weakened Empire. The glory days of the Septums were a distant memory. Valenwood and Elsphere were gone, ceded to the Thalmor enemy. Blackmarsh had been lost to Imperial rule since the aftermath of the Oblivion Crisis, 
Morrowind had never recovered fully from the eruption of Mount Vardenfell, Hammerfell was plagued by infighting between crowns and forebears. Only High Rock, Cyrodiil, and Skyrim remained prosperous and peaceful. Emperor Titus Mede had only a few short years to consolidate his rule before his leadership was put to the ultimate test. The war begins. On the 30th of Frostfall, 4E-171, the Eldmari Dominion sent an ambassador to the Imperial City with a gift in a covered cart and an ultimatum for the new emperor. The long list of demands included staggering tributes, disbandment of the blades, outlawing the worship of Talos, and ceding large sections of Hammerfell to the Dominion. Despite the warnings of his generals of the Empire's military weakness, Emperor Titus Mede II rejected the ultimatum. The Thalmor ambassador upended the cart, spilling over a hundred heads on the floor. Every Blades agent in Somerset and Valenwood, and so began the Great War, which would consume the Empire and the Eldmari Dominion for the next five years. Within days, Eldmari armies invaded Hammerfell and Cyrodiil simultaneously. A strong force commanded by the Thalmor general Lord Narifin attacked Cyrodiil from the south, marching out of hidden camps in northern Elsphere and flanking the imperial defenses along the Valenwood border. Leowin soon fell to the invaders, while Brathil was cut off and besieged. At the same time, an Almari army under Lady Aranella crossed into western Cyrodiil from Valenwood bypassing Anvil and Kvatch, and crossing into Hammerfell. Smaller Aldmari forces landed along the southern coastline of Hammerfell. The disunited Redguard forces offered only scattered resistance to the invaders, and much of the southern coastline was quickly overrun. The greatly outnumbered Imperial legions retreated across the Alkir Desert in the now famous March of Thirst. 4E 172 to 173, the Aldmari advance into Cyrodiil. It appears now that the initial Aldmari objective was in fact the conquest of Hammerfell, and that the invasion of Cyrodiil was intended only to pin down the Imperial legions while Hammerfell was overrun. However, the surprising initial success of Lord Narifin's attack led the Thalmor to believe that the Empire was weaker than they had thought. The capture of the Imperial City itself and the complete overthrow of the Empire thus became their primary objective of the next two years. As we know, the Thalmor nearly achieved their objective. It was only because of our Emperor's determined leadership during the Empire's darkest hour that this disaster was averted. During 4E-172, the Eldmari advanced deeper into Cyrodiil. Breville and Anvil both fell to the invaders. By the end of the year, Lord Narifin had advanced to the very walls of the Imperial City. There were fierce naval clashes in Lake Rumar and along the Nibbin as the Imperial forces attempted to hold the eastern bank. In Hammerfell, the Thalmor were content to consolidate their gains as they took control of the whole southern coastline, which was in fact their stated objective in the ultimatum delivered to the Emperor. Of the southern cities, only Hegeth still held out. The survivors of the March of Thirst regrouped in northern Hammerfell, joined by reinforcements from High Rock. The year 4E-173 saw stiffening imperial resistance in Cyrodiil. The year 4E-173 saw stiffening imperial resistance in Cyrodiil, but the seemingly inexorable Aldmari advance continued. Fresh legions from Skyrim bolstered the Emperor's main army in the Imperial City, but the Eldmari forced the crossing of the Nibbin and began advancing in force up the eastern bank. By the end of the year, the Imperial City was surrounded on three sides. Only the northern supply route to Bruma remained open. In Hammerfell, Imperial fortunes took a turn for the better. In early 4E-173, 
a forebear army from Sentinel broke the siege of Hegeth, a crown city, leading to the reconciliation of the two factions. Despite this, Lady Aranella's main army succeeded in crossing the Alkir Desert. The Imperial legions under General Dissanius met them outside Skaven in a bloody and indecisive clash. Dissanius withdrew and left Aranella in possession of Skaven, but the Aldmari were too weakened to continue their advance. According to most versions of the tale, the Magisters did indeed reach the Golden City and walked into the home of the Maker, where no living being before them had dared or been able to tread. But humanity is not meant to walk in heaven. The Magisters were wicked with pride and other sins, and their presence tainted the Golden 